Tonight, protesting climate change in Vancouver with the team who's ignited a global movement. We will make world leaders act. We can and we will. What marchers think they can change by banding together. Out of control wildfires lead to evacuation orders for tens of thousands in California. A final report spells out who's at fault for that deadly Boeing crash in Indonesia. And Canadian kids share stories about school violence. People call me like dumb, stupid, kill myself. What can happen when it goes to court, what girls experience, and what can be done to make things better. This is The National. On two fronts today, using the streets and the courts, young people desperate for climate action sent a message to Ottawa. Thousands marched in Vancouver in a climate strike, and global activist Greta Thunberg was there. At the same time, a handful of people launched a legal case, suing the Canadian government for, they say, not doing enough. Let's start with Greg Rasmussen in the crowd today. Build our future, not our pipeline! Build our future! This latest climate strike drew thousands onto the streets. Young people worried about what's coming and families concerned about their children. It's, their future is at stake and our whole planet's at stake right now. Um, we're a, this is a crisis that's right now and our politicians aren't responding quickly enough. With schools closed for the day, the march tied up downtown Vancouver for hours. These demonstrations are large, they're loud and they're very energetic, but do they make a difference? It's really easy to feel like you as an individual don't have the power to change much and it's really easy to feel hopeless and I think when you attend these strikes and when you're here and you see the presence, you see you're not alone. The crowd embraced 16-year-old Greta Thunberg who founded the Fridays for Future climate strikes just over a year ago. We are a wave of change and together we are unstoppable. <laughs> Her message with that familiar hard edge blaming adults for failing to act despite decades of warnings. If the adults really loved us, they would at least do everything they possibly could to make sure that we had a safe future. But they are not doing that. Supporters hope Thunberg's blunt message, backed by climate science, highlights the need for immediate action. I think people are shocked when they see people our age telling the truth about what's going to happen to our future and what's going to happen to the planet because it's jarring. It scares them. They don't want to hear it. A dire message in so many ways, but one wrapped in the hope of real change. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, before the march, 15 young people filed a lawsuit against the Canadian government, alleging it's violating their charter rights by not doing enough to counter climate change. The Canadian government cannot say that they did not know about the danger that we would face. They cannot say that they have done their best. They cannot even say that what they're doing is changing anything. The plaintiffs range in age from 10 to 19, and they're not looking for money just for the government to be forced to act. And there are other lawsuits just like this one in the US, India, and the Netherlands. Okay, many young Canadians are dealing with a different kind of crisis, sometimes every day, and where they should feel safest, they are school students facing assault or sexual abuse at the hands of their peers. It's a national problem that's hard to fully understand thanks to a lack of data. And when CBC News asked school boards across Canada about student violence, most refused to answer. So we went directly to kids. In a survey of more than 4,000 current and former students, their experiences are the basis of our special report. Now, last night, we spoke to boys who endured life-threatening attacks. Tonight, we take a closer look at the danger girls face, including sexual abuse. And as David Common explains, sometimes the victims are shockingly young. What happened in Cornerbrook was a horror for one mother, but so many parents were also left in the dark. Allegations a teenage boy was groping an eight-year-old girl over many months on a school bus. We've hidden her mom's identity. Yes, he did. Under, under her clothes, under her undergarments, yes. When you 
heard that. Mm -hmm. What did you think? I was numb, shock. I just didn't know how it was possible that this, this could even happen on a school bus. She was even more shocked after the boy was charged at what the school did not do. How many other parents who had kids on that bus were told by the board that there were allegations? None. Happened? Zero. Zero, yes. They just didn't want to deal with it. They, they just wanted to sweep it under the rug. Keep it secret. Keep it secret, yeah. In our national survey of students, only one in four girls were completely satisfied by how their school responded after reporting an incident of sexually inappropriate behavior. More than one in four experienced unwanted sexual contact, including touching or grabbing, while one in seven girls had a sex act forced upon them by another student, including oral sex or touching their breasts or genitals. In the aftermath of the school bus allegations, charges were laid, though the court ruled there wasn't enough evidence to convict. Meanwhile, the school board says it's changing some policies. Should students assume that you've got their back? Oh, always. Always students should assume we have their back. And have you always been successful at that? I think it has been a learning process for everybody involved. The girl on board the bus moved to another school, something alleged victims repeatedly told us they've done to stay safe. Okay, so David, when you think about that girl on the school bus. I mean, th there must be so many other people who have their own stories. And we're hearing from hundreds of them just in the, the 24, 48 hours since we've started talking about this here at CBC. We've received many, many messages. Young women who've been groped at school, um, people who have been physically assaulted or bullied, parents who don't really know what to do, where to turn. But you've been telling us that Thing that that school seem particularly eager to talk about at least publicly yes yeah, certainly some have been but many have just rebuffed our efforts when we've asked them what's happening within your own school would you provide us any numbers or, or when we've tried to access them and the violence prevention experts we've said and we've talked to have repeatedly said that hiding an issue is really no way to fix it David Common thanks very much and a little later, you'll hear from a student who says he was targeted, couldn't escape his tormentors, and now his mother is taking the school board to court. That's in about 15 minutes' time. Okay, in California, the wildfire situation has gotten worse. Flames have grown quickly and traveled even faster. 50,000 people fled their homes overnight after a brush fire in a suburb of Los Angeles exploded. And crews were already struggling with the out-of-control Kincaid fire in Northern California's wine region. 2,000 people there forced to leave. But this latest one in the south, known as the Tick Fire, could be even more challenging. Fueled by California's Santa Ana winds, the fire flared up unexpectedly, jumped a highway, you see the cars stopping there, then spread into residential areas of Santa Clarita. Kim Brunhuber went there today. 50 kilometers northwest of Los Angeles, an ember from the Tick Fire touches off this patch of dry grass. In these winds, a small fire like this could burn down a neighborhood. But out of the smoke, just in time, firefighters. About 300 meters away, watching nervously from their deck, Heidi and Mike Moody. It was like Armageddon out here last night. Last night, this fire spread all the way to their backyard. What's it been like with the fire so close? It's scary. I mean, last night we thought for sure we were going to lose this place, but uh, the uh, water dropping helicopters saved it. Some of their neighbors weren't as lucky. High winds and dry air have sparked several major fires across California. Tens of thousands are under evacuation orders, but the Moody's decided to stay. We slept down in our field in our trailer because uh, the fire was its still burning down below us here. They're also among the hundreds of thousands of Californians without power as utilities shut off electricity to prevent downed lines from sparking fires. But in at least one case, those precautions may have failed. In rural Sonoma County, the massive Kincaid fire burns out of control, growing at a rate of about 30 football fields a minute. Dozens of buildings have been destroyed. Now the state's largest utility company admits a power line broke in the area and at the time the fire started. The transmission line was not among the lines we de-energized in Sonoma County. We still at this point do not know exactly what happened. 
This is the second major planned blackout in two weeks, and officials warn the forecasted high winds mean there will likely be more this weekend, affecting as many as two million people. The Moody's are dreading nightfall, scanning the valley, looking for the return of that baleful orange glow. While right below them, the firefighters vanish from sight into the billowing smoke. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Santa Clarita, California. To the UK now, where police made three more arrests in that suspected human smuggling tragedy. 39 people died, and tonight we're learning about one of them. A Vietnamese family has released heart-wrenching text messages apparently sent by a daughter as time was running out. Renee Filipponi has the details. Throughout the day, bodies were taken to a nearby hospital. Autopsies are now underway, not only to determine how they died, but look for any clues to find out who they were. Beijing is urging UK authorities to confirm the identities, verify the facts, and punish those responsible. The Chinese embassy in London has sent a team to Essex. Despite early police reports all the victims were Chinese, it may not be the case. The family of 26-year-old Pham Tra Mi believe she died in the container. From a poor area in Vietnam, her family says she paid $50,000 to smugglers, hoping for a better life. At the time the container sailed to England, she frantically texted her family. Translated, it says, I'm sorry, Mom and Dad. The road abroad is not successful. Mommy, I love you very much. I'm dying because I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. Mommy, I'm sorry. They haven't heard from her since. A number of other Vietnamese families are also concerned about missing loved ones. Chief Constable Pippa Mills. Today, three police. more arrests. This is a fast-moving investigation involving significant police resources. A man was arrested at Stansted Airport and a husband and wife taken into custody in Thank northwest you. England. Thank you, guys. All three on suspicion of conspiracy to traffic people and 39 counts of manslaughter. The driver of the truck is still being questioned. Trafficking happens um, very often into the UK. This advocate says trafficking networks are complex and difficult to investigate. If it is indeed a complex organized crime ring, um, there would be lots of pieces perhaps across many different countries and many different continents. As the investigation continues, the numbers will turn to names and their suffering in the back of that container becomes more real. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Now to the case of an airline tragedy from last October. Lion Air Flight 610 plunged into the Java Sea just 13 minutes after takeoff. But it took nearly a year for the release of a final report into how it crashed. Peter Armstrong shows us the string of failures that led to the deaths of 189 people. Relatives have waited months, and now they know the Lion Air crash should never have happened. I'm not satisfied, said this man whose son died in the crash. It feels like they're bullying common people like us who don't understand. Today's report blames a combination of design flaws, regulatory lapses, and a lack of training. It zeroed in on a now well-known automated system in these planes. They did not recognize to the what happened to the aircraft. At issue here is the so-called MCAS system. If instruments detected the nose getting too high, it would prompt the stabilizer in the tail to pitch the aircraft down. But the system depends entirely on a single sensor, which was improperly repaired. Boeing never told the pilots about the system, so they didn't know how to react when it malfunctioned. In a statement, Boeing says it's updating training and manuals as well as the software. These software changes will prevent the flight control conditions that occurred in this accident from ever happening again. I think we'll certainly use some of this new information for our lawsuit procedures with Boeing, says this family member of a victim, but it may not be that easy. The report's not supposed to be used in any legal proceedings. Boeing hopes to get the planes approved to fly again by the end of the year. Its profits have fallen more than 50% since this time last year, and even if those planes are approved, the question remains whether anyone will fly in them. One Canadian flight attendant told CBC News, I will not ever willingly fly this aircraft. I will refuse dangerous work if confronted. And one report in the U.S. found at least 20% of passengers would initially avoid going in this plane even after it was approved to fly. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. 
Okay, time for a quick break. We're back in two minutes with news about your health. Why do so many women say their menopause symptoms are being misdiagnosed or worse, dismissed? Plus. <laughs> Yikes, look at that. Terrifying moments caught on video during a windstorm in Alberta. Details on a skyscraper rescue. Next. A new and wide-ranging report has found that many women who experience the symptoms of menopause feel they aren't getting the health care they need. But as Karen Pauls explains, a group that calls itself Menopause Chicks is hoping to open a conversation for change. Welcome. Build as an ask anything session. It doesn't take long for this meeting of the menopause chicks to get right into it. I'm curious which hormone deals with which symptoms. Estrogen can address night sweats. It can address sleep difficulties. To be talking about a frank discussion is exactly what Shirley Weir was looking for when she started experiencing anxiety, depression, sleep deprivation, and brain fog, some classic symptoms of perimenopause. She was disappointed with her doctor's response. She said, oh, you're 41, you're too young for menopause, but if you want to go on the birth control pill or take sleeping pills or I can prescribe an antidepressant. A recent study by the BC Women's Health Foundation found one third of the women surveyed felt their health care needs weren't being met. Nearly 60% of those 45 to 54 said a physician had overlooked or diminished their symptoms, including those associated with menopause. It's almost as if when women are aging that they don't matter. Dr. Wendy Wolfman teaches family physicians at the University of Toronto. She says it can be hard to have long conversations with patients. Physicians feel they're not compensated for their time. It's time that we as mature women spoke up for ourselves and demanded that this is an important area of health care. So we help women. Shirley uh, Weir is know, doing just that. that menopause, menopause chicks that recently hit 12,000 uh, members. The best way that we can empower women is to uh, give them quality education and information. We're going to talk a little bit just quickly about pelvic floor fitness and in particular Kegels. So this member appreciates the, the information and, and support. It's kept me sane. I have to be honest, it kept me sane. Is there benefit? Learning which questions to ask and where to get answers, taking control of their own health. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Vancouver. Okay, among the other stories we're following tonight, Winnipeg MP Jim Carr, the Minister of International Trade, has been diagnosed with cancer. In a statement, Carr says he had been experiencing flu-like symptoms and went for blood work earlier this week. He was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, a type of blood cancer. He's now getting treatment for it. The 68-year-old was just re-elected in his Winnipeg South Centre riding on Monday, just one of four Liberal MPs elected in the prairies. In Ontario, ads promoting vaping products in convenience stores and gas stations will soon be banned. And even the Canadian Vaping Association supports the idea. It's important that our youth don't get exposed to the marketing of these products. Uh, these products were always intended for adult smokers. Officials say new rules will take effect in January, restricting ads to vape and cannabis retail stores only. The move reverses an earlier decision by the Ford government to scrap a ban set up by the previous Liberal regime. And some terrifying video coming to us from Edmonton tonight. Take a look at what strong winds did to a pair of workers in the city's downtown. As you can see, one of the workers was left dangling by his safety harness after those winds pulled the scaffolding away from the building, then sent it crashing back. Now, amazingly, neither person was injured, and firefighters were able to rescue them within minutes. Edmonton was under a wind warning at the time of the accident. Okay, we'll be right back with more news here on The National. A horde of climbers scaled an Australian landmark one last time today. A sacred monolith turned selfie magnet. But first, she says her son was the victim of racist attacks at school. Now she's taking the school board to court. That's next. Let's dig deeper into one of our top stories now. School violence suffered by kids at the hands of their peers. 
The tactics used to exploit victims can be disturbingly similar from case to case, but the motivation can often be different. Race plays a part in this next story. But as you'll also see, the reaction of parents can be very different too. It's a sad reality for this 15-year-old boy that the very place he goes to escape his hardships is also so lonely. It's like a lot of people judge. People call me like dumb, stupid, kill myself. For his own safety, we're not identifying who this is. We'll just call him E.H. But know this, he's been called the N-word. He's been attacked at school. He threw my crutches to the ground and it was like a fight, a big fight. And then I got my head slammed into the water fountain. And at least twice, those fights were caught on video. E.H. is the one underneath the pile, goaded into a fight, then ganged up on. The perpetrators were suspended for this, but so was E.H., and the attacks kept coming. E.H. even requested a transfer to another school, but was denied. Over the course of a year, always reassured that things would get better, they didn't. What would you have wanted the school to do at that point? To hear what we're saying, you know, to, to believe us and say that this shouldn't be happening. Well, the first thing I say to the parents is, um, we're sorry that you're not having the kind of experience that we want you to have. Cecil Roach speaks for the school board on this case. It saddens me in a way. It saddens me as a, as a teacher, as, a, as an educator, and as a person. However, I, I do realize that, you know, the issue of racism um, is an issue that the whole country is facing. So I'm not surprised that it's happening in our schools. Our schools are not immune to that, clearly. But E.H.'s mom says the school board failed in its duty to protect her son and is suing the board for a million dollars, a dollar value she believes sends a message. I mean, things will happen in Roach the can't give details about E.H.'s case, but at the board level, he says these matters are taken seriously. Case in point, just this week, 12,000 of the school board's staff went through anti-black racism training. Still, the parent that we've spoken to in this case, when she hears the board say things like, you know, we have zero tolerance mm -hmm. for, for violence, for racism. Yeah. I mean, I think she would say that's just not true. Yes, we do have zero tolerance for, for, for issues of racism, discrimination, uh, in, in, uh, in whatever form it takes. However, incidents will happen because, look, incidents happen in society. Our schools are not immune to that. Brush it away or... Not good enough, mm -hmm. says EH's mom. 90% of the day, our children are with them. We need to know what is taking place. What is their thoughts? What is the outcome? Winston Karam is someone who knows full well how hard it can be to make school boards responsible. Now he's a college student. But when he was in grade seven at Broadview Public School in Ottawa, he too was singled out. It'd be like, get out of here, asshole, get F word. Um. Then the name-calling became more personal, the N-word. Violence followed, pushing, choking. And Winston says nobody seemed to care. You're just boys being boys. You're just like, that's just how you interact. Like, just ignore them and you'll be all good. The advice didn't work. Winston's tormentors just pushed harder. So do you have homework to do today? or I might do a bit of, like, note stuff. His mother, Vanya, eventually took the school board to court, and the judge took her side. It was a landmark ruling. The school was negligent, liable for inaction. But the amount Winston's family was to be paid in damages? Just $3,800. Was it worth it in the end? Yeah. I know that sounds crazy. Like, I spent $54,000 on this. But look at him. Look at Winston. He's the bomb. He's so strong and amazing and... He came out the other side. He put his parts back together again. And this was, I think the trials were like part of those pieces. Not at all. And E.H.'s mom isn't sure how this latest legal story will end, but she's pretty clear about what she wants. Someone has to be accountable for these students that are being bullied. Parents are sending their children off to school and some students don't even get to come home. You wish people would, would listen to you? Yeah, because getting bullied is like the worst thing, the worst feeling. 
The courts can move ever so slowly in cases like this. In the meantime, though, EH's troubles far from over. He's moved schools, but the taunts on social media have followed him. Still, he and his mom are hopeful that there is light at the end of the tunnel, that things will change eventually. But those changes can't come soon enough. And next, we're continuing our exploration of the matter with a conversation about solutions. How can we better support the kids who are being targeted? And what about the attackers themselves? Back in two minutes. Welcome back. Before the break, we heard from two boys whose families sued their school board for failing to protect them. And yesterday, we heard from other victims of school violence, one of whom was almost killed. If you go to a teacher, then you just get labeled like as a snitch or whatever, and that'll just like make more people hate you. Nobody's helping, nobody's doing anything, and it's just, everybody's recording, everybody's having a great time. So tonight, we wanna try to answer the questions. What do victims need? Why is helping so hard? And what about the perpetrators of violence? Maybe they need help too. On Fridays, we try to take one topic in the news and we break it wide open in a way that's interesting, insightful, and empowering. And we always have help to do that. Joining us around the table, we have Deborah Pepler, a child psychologist and a leading researcher in youth violence. Terrence Rodriguez, founder of Rex Pride here in Toronto, which provides a safe space for LGBTQ youth and senior data journalist Valerie Willette, who's been an integral part of this school violence series rollout uh, on CBC News. Okay, let's take a look at this. According to our national survey of 4,000 students and former students, a third of youths told us they were physically assaulted at least once in elementary or middle school, and it was about that same number in high school as well. So our first question is, what do victims of violence in schools need? Terrence, I want to start with you, and, and before we start, this is something that that has touched you personally? Yeah, um, well, um, had a hard time with Catholic school and public school from elementary all the way through high school because I was actually born a female, transitioned into male. And so my queer identity definitely affected a lot of my experiences um, from a very early age. So it was little things getting made fun of, dressing up as a, as a girl, trying to fit in, getting laughed at, getting taunted, followed home from school um, to more um, extreme in high school, getting sexual harassment three times in my life, in my, my uh, high school career, and um, getting graffiti on my lockers. Um, I think the worst, though, was when the school board asked me to leave my lifestyle at home. Tell me, what, as, as someone who has lived through that kind of victimization, the attacks, the taunts, the harassment, what do victims of that need? I mean, you know, short term, medium term, long term. Um, it starts really with someone to listen to them. Uh, having people there to support you is first and foremost the strongest thing and the most powerful thing because if isolation, feeling alone is what really drops you into that depression, into that hopeless feeling. Deborah, how good is the system at providing some of the things that Terrence is talking about? Well, I think we're working toward it, but we have a long way to go. Uh, there's been an improvement in uh, the rates of youth reporting that they've bullied others, but an increase in the rates of youth who report they're being victimized. So they're still not safe. And at least in Ontario, the Education Act says the first responsibility of principals and teachers is to keep children safe. And the second responsibility is to to educate them. So, and, but, but even that first hurdle that Terrence outlined, I mean, just, just feeling like someone's listening to you, right? I mean, that, that seems like a big piece because every, every student that I've talked to as part of this series, their first thing is that they feel like the, the, the teachers and the staff didn't believe them, told them to just, you know, pull your bootstraps up, hey, this is how kids act, this is how kids interact, this is normal. Well, what we know is that youth very seldom come forward and report an incident if it hasn't happened. Mm -hmm. they, they're really honest. There's shame and embarrassment in reporting this. So when they do come forward, we should listen to them. They, we encourage youth to talk to trusted adults. And if the first adult doesn't respond, go and tell another adult until you get an adult who is listening and ready to take action. Okay, now... On the scope of the overall problem, consider another finding in our survey. More than a third of children who experienced violence in elementary or middle school did not report 
the incidents to anybody. And in high school, it was nearly half of students who didn't report any of the violence incidents. This begins to answer the question of why it can be so hard to help. But Valerie, I mean, in your work, you found a whole host of reasons. There's a lot of different reasons. We know that students don't always speak up. We know that teachers don't always speak up. But what I've heard most often is what's called reputational risks. School principals work really hard to give their schools a good reputation. And they might be scared that if they report their real violence statistics, that might impact their reputation. Because they might be seen as the violent school in the area. Because you're, you're, in your work, mm -hmm. you found gaps in reporting. Oh, we found a lot of gaps in reporting. Tell me about that. What we did is uh, we started with Ontario because we believed that would be a system that had mandatory reporting. And what we found when we got our figures was a lot of different gaps, a lot of red flags, a lot of inconsistencies. 18 school boards out of 76 reported zero violent incidents for more than two years. Right. And when we showed those figures to researchers like Deb, what we found was that they're really that, that shows that there is vast underreporting on the part of school boards. Right, but because it defies belief that there could be zero incidents. I mean, we're talking about school boards who have 40, 50,000 children enrolled. Right. That's very difficult to reconcile as a data journalist, but also for the researchers we showed this to. Right. But even Canada-wide, we're seeing that four out of 13 provinces and territories have mandatory systems to even report. In other places, it is apples and oranges. Sometimes it's voluntary, and sometimes it's even up to each school principal to define what is violence and decide on their own whether or not they decide to report it or not. So there is very little incentive to report. We're going to talk more about the data in just a second, but, but Deborah, I mean, when it comes to the question of, of bringing this issue to light, I mean, you know, we started with the statistic about students, right, who, who themselves don't always feel comfortable reporting. How do you even begin to, to encourage that level of, of confidence in the system that if you do it, something will, will come of it? Well, I think we need to have checks and balances. So. Yes, mandatory reporting is really important because if we put an issue on the table, we can look at it, work with it, think about it, but, but it shouldn't be punitive. And I think principals, uh, as Valerie suggested, are really worried about the reputation of their schools. What we should be doing is moving resources into schools where this is a problem, helping teachers develop the social emotional skills and capacities that children need, the respect for others that they need, and learn how to get power in a positive way rather than a negative way. There should be reinforcement, support for, for those right. schools who are having That's that, right. that kind of a problem. Um, you know, th there is another side to the coin of student violence that, that I will say doesn't always get talked about as much, and that is the perpetrator. So what are we to think about and what are we to do when it comes to helping them, making them part of the solution? Terrence, I mean, you've dealt with perpetrators mm -hmm. of, of bad things. How, I, I'm just kind of curious, how do you think of them? They're human beings. There's nothing more you need to think of. That's all we are. Whether you're youth, adult, whatever, we're all human, be human beings and that's what people tend to forget when you say mm -hmm. perpetrator that puts them in a box and it makes it easy for people to treat them a certain way. But if we remember that they're human beings, we realize we're all complicated and everybody has their own reasons for whatever they do in life. And so we need to find out for this person, why did they do it? And that's pretty much what I do. Finding that compassion mm -hmm. can't be easy, right? Because, I mean, you see so often the knee-jerk reaction is detention, suspensions. Does that work? Is that an effective way of dealing with it? Well, you could ask the question, what are these children or youth learning when they sit on a bench for two hours? Are they learning how to relate to others in a better way? Are they learning how to, mm. to, to respect others? No, they're learning that the people who are in power get to control them and distress them. What we really need to do is provide supports. And, and again, you could ask the question, does it make sense to exclude these young people from school? No, school may be the safest place in their daily life. And so if there are things that we can do, provide supports as a society for these youth and families, then we'll be able to move these young people onto a healthier pathway than the one they're on. Valerie, did, did your 
work trickle on to this part of the equation? Well, when we couldn't find violent incidents data or violent statistics, we asked schools what else they had for us. Right. And what we found is what little figures they had was exactly on that. It was on punishment. It was on suspensions and expulsions huh. and which kids were suspended and expelled. And they had really detailed data on that. They knew their gender, their grade, they could track stuff. But what we realized is that they probably were not really doing that. But if that data was used, even provincially or nationally, right. we could use it, as Deborah was saying, to find resources and give those resources to schools who are having to give the support to perpetrators. Guys, th this has been a wonderful conversation. I have to stop it there, but this is clearly just the beginning. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you for taking the time. Um, one last thing that I want to say. So th this entire series, it's really elicited an incredible outpouring of, of questions, of comments, concerns, and also stories from you. And we want to continue hearing from you. So send us an email at schoolviolence at cbc.ca. And we know there are students who watch this program as well. So if you need help, Kids Help Phone Counselors are available 24-7 at the number and social media sites on your screen. Now looking ahead, Sunday on The National, we're going to show you one possible solution to the issue of school violence, a concrete approach that, if done the right way, can really help put students who do bad things on the right path. We want to make sure that children have a chance to feel that they've been heard. We've got children who feel good about themselves, who will maybe feel a little bit more confident. He didn't feel that good about himself. Now he holds his head up high a lot more. He stands up straight and he's like, you know, I'm the man. <laughs> you can see it in his face. You're going to meet that boy and we're going to show you what's behind that school's success Sunday on The National. And we will be right back with more news, including an accidental phone call between Donald Trump's lawyer and a reporter. The first. In case you missed it, climbing is now banned on Australia's iconic Uluru monolith. I guess it's an emotional day knowing that people were, you know, no longer going to be disrespecting the, the rock and the culture. For Australia's Aboriginal people, Uluru is sacred, but their pleas to stop climbing it have been ignored for decades. You have to do what you feel right doing. And I wanted to climb, so I climbed. Tourists have heedlessly hiked, golfed, even done a strip tease on the summit. And this is before Instagram made the climb a bankable social moment. In the weeks leading up to the closure, the area has been overwhelmed with trash, thanks to last minute crowds, full of talk about respect for indigenous culture, but. But since it was an optional thing to do, I decided to do it. You kind of want to have it as a challenge to get up the rock. So, yeah, everyone has their own opinion, but I don't see the harm in climbing. Work begins now to restore Uluru to a pristine state. Meanwhile, people are still welcome to tour the base. Welcome back. One of U.S. President Donald Trump's top defenders is raising eyebrows tonight after what's best described as a butt-dialing incident to an NBC News reporter. The problem is we need some money. We need a few hundred thousand. In a three-minute voicemail, President Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, discusses overseas dealings and, as you heard there, laments a need for cash. Now, understandably, uh, the quality of the recording is pretty lousy, so it's hard to understand the context of what he's saying. A federal investigation is looking at Giuliani's dealings in Ukraine. Felicity Huffman has left prison two days early. The Desperate Housewives actor was supposed to serve 14 days for her role in the U.S. college admissions scandal, but prison policy allows inmates who are scheduled for release on weekends to be let out on Friday. Huffman's sentence also included a fine and 250 hours of community service. She pleaded guilty last spring to paying thousands of dollars to have her daughter's SAT scores fixed. The European Union has agreed in principle to yet another Brexit extension, but with no new departure date set, things are still a bit up in the air. The British Prime Minister says he still wants to leave next week, deal or no deal. October the 31st is still possible. We could leave on October the 31st. So he's wrong. Unfortunately, it depends, uh, unfortunately, it depends on what the EU says. 
Yeah, but the EU is worried that setting a new date could influence political events in London. On Monday, Parliament is set to vote on Boris Johnson's call for a December election. And anti-government protests flared in Chile's capital again today. <laughs> Nearly a million people flooded the streets of Santiago, the biggest protest yet in a week of demonstrations. Protests started over a hike in public transit fares, but quickly grew with anger building over inequality and government corruption. At least 19 people have died in the turmoil that has swept the South American nation. Okay, time for a quick break. But up next, there's certainly high fashion and now high art. Why sneakers aren't just for wearing anymore. <laughs> Back in two minutes. This must be it. The entrance to the underworld. It's Murdoch dabbling with the dark side. There's evil up there. What was that? And don't tell me that was nothing. That was definitely something. Murdoch Mysteries, Monday at 8 on CBC and CBC Gem. A traveling exhibit closed tonight in Hong Kong with pieces by world famous artists. Their medium of choice, sneakers. And the going price for some of the finest pieces out there, a million bucks. So Leka Nathu shows us why. I like shoes. Uh, I like, I wear them every day. I wear sneakers every day. It's fun to show them off. Um, it's fun to talk to people about sneakers. Don't ask Meredith Hardy how many pairs of sneakers she owns. Enough that all the storage in my condo is filled up. You're not gonna pin me down on a number. <laughs> the Toronto-based sneaker enthusiast has turned her passion for collecting into a strong following on Instagram. Hardy says self-proclaimed sneakerheads have always considered the functional shoe a form of art. But outsiders, that's new. There's a lot more energy around the buying and selling and making money around sneakers than there used to be. Um, I think a lot fewer people are buying to wear and more people are buying to sell. It started decades ago as a status symbol in urban communities. Then sneakers became popularized by hip hop culture and celebrity collaborations. Sneakers are now being viewed and sold as high art, just like paintings or sculptures, and with the same eyebrow-raising price tag. Canadian investor Miles Nadal made headlines earlier this year when he purchased a collection of sneakers from a Sotheby's auction for more than a million dollars. That's right, a million dollars worth of sneakers. Moments like that are milestones within the zeitgeist. Steve Harris co-founded Sneakertopia, LA's first ever pop-up museum devoted solely to sneakers. This M&M is, uh, is like 30 plus thousand dollars. This sneaker pop-up is just like a gallery. It has high-priced exhibits and high-priced security. Even auction houses are, <laughs> are in the reselling game now. Um, what does that mean? Like, what, what does it's, that tell it's, you? It's, it's, it's become a respected commodity, a, a piece of art. And like traditional artwork, the sneaker's worth is often determined by how much someone is willing to pay with one difference. All of this will turn yellow, like an un unattractive shade of yellow too. Unlike art, sneakers deteriorate relatively quickly. Almost every pair you see here, the sole will eventually crumble into dust with age, even if they're never worn. Zule Kanethu, CBC News, Los Angeles. <laughs> the moment is next on The National, the tale of the hen that longed to be free. <laughs> we'll be right back. When employees of a Montreal grocery store opened the door of a delivery truck full of eggs, they found an unexpected passenger had hitched a ride. A chicken, specifically a hen, who would very quickly come to be called Beatrice the hen. And if her ride was meant as an act of escape, well, it worked. She's safe in the hands of the SBCA, and her tale is our moment. Yesterday we received a call from a supermarket saying that when they received a delivery of eggs 
um, there was a live chicken inside the truck. Of course, immediately we went to go pick up the chicken, who we named Beatrice, and um, she was uh, severely dehydrated. Of course, we don't know exactly where she comes from, but we were very lucky that we received that call. Beatrice's story is definitely a, a remarkable story, and we're just so happy to have been able to, to help her. So Beatrice is going to spend the weekend with us here, um, but uh, next week she's going to be going to her own uh, sanctuary. Um, so there is a family out there who is uh, very eager to take her in and let her live uh, the life that a chicken should. So there you go. Happy Friday. That's a good, uh, good way to end the week. Uh, apparently, you know, Beatrice is going to have many good years ahead of her. Chickens only lay eggs for a couple of years. Uh, there's a small window there, but can live 10, 12 years in all. So uh, good times ahead for her. That's The National for this October 25th. Good night.